So, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kaliopo Tsurupidou, for those who do not know me. And I work for the Foundation's uh, support and safety team uh, as a community advocate. We primarily deal with uh, abuse, escalated abuse in the projects, and uh, I work on that field as well as sort of policy. Um, I would like, because I don't have a very loud voice, I would like to invite those of you interested in actually hearing to come and sit further to the front. Um, though no obligation, you can stay where you are as well, that's fine. But you might miss the best part. <laughs> so, what are Pardon? There's no microphone. There is no, no microphone, there is no. One, uh, because we have only two sessions here today and uh, to tell you the cost of There you go. So. I'm being honest with you. So yes, if, if, if you have any issues with not uh, hearing me loud enough, by all means do come to the front. I'm not going to be asking you any questions. Uh, so I'm not going to put you in a difficult position. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, how to, to create and maintain safe in-person events, like events like this, where we all come together and uh, we want to uh, make the most of it and feel safe and supported. Um, technical glitch. There we go. So, safety matters. Um, In-person events have been at the core of the Wikimedia universe since its early days. Um, Real-life meetups uh, have been happening um, pretty much on a monthly basis these days, uh, bringing contributors from around the world together in very productive ways. At the same time, they also provide opportunity for conflict uh, opportunity for unwanted contact, unwanted attention, privacy violations, and other forms of behavior that can make people feel um, a range of negative feelings that can go from un uncomfortable all the way to unsafe. And that can have uh, a big impact on uh, how productive you are and how you experience that particular event. So, speaking of unsafe, uh, I'd like to touch upon the concept of safety itself. Um, most manuals on event safety that I've come up, uh, I've come up across, uh, without fail, they they tend to focus on physical safety at events, um, which can be creating contingency plans in case of an emergency, <coughs> escape routes. Uh, meeting requirements for maximum amount of people that you can have in a room at any time, uh, and things like that. While we want users to feel physically safe, we also want to make sure that they feel psychologically safe to be in that environment, because that allows uh, people to participate and engage more fully. So. Psychological and physical events means happy participants, and happy participants means uh, more uh, productive participants. So, when you lack one or the other, that is physical or psychological safety during your event, uh, the effects can be quite serious and they can have considerable, considerable effects. Um, there are several things that could happen during an event. Um, and those include stop attending events. People decide that once they had a bad experience, they just don't want to be in that event, they might leave on the spot, or they might actually choose to not attend that event anymore, or not attend other events as well. So you're losing them as active participants from your event. It only really takes one incident for somebody to go from really wanting to be there and be part of the community, and crossing over to the other side where they really don't want to be there anymore. Um, so they are generally discouraged from attendance. They also stop forging the Wikimedia culture. 
by no longer attending in-person events, people lose the ability to be part of a collective part of culture forging through creating content, through creating shared memories. They lose the connection with others in the local community and the more global community. They also can, uh, can reduce the contribution levels. Like people decide not only to not go to events, but to be completely, to stop completely being part of the community. And that's obviously not a good thing. Sometimes it can, co it can cause people to go into a wiki break, so they just stop for a, for a specific amount of time, uh, or they just stop entirely. And obviously this is not what we want. They can also affect expansion. People stop spreading the word. You know, if people are unhappy and uncomfortable themselves being in such events, they won't tell their friends to be part of the community. They will not encourage others to go to events as well. So that means that we could also potentially lose new editors or people who just joined and, you know, they were at that point where between deciding whether to continue to contribute to the movement or go the other way and just completely stop. But most importantly, at least in my personal opinion, we lose perspective. Each and every individual contributor brings in their own unique perspective. Not just the culture, but their, also the, their personal perspective. And for a movement that prides itself in multiculturalism, the loss of a single perspective can, be, can basically mean loss of motivation, and it can be quite damaging, and can bring a, a lot of um, negative effects to the project. So we're talking about safety at events, and here I am telling you about, oh, this could be so bad for us, but what could actually mean, what could that actually mean? What could go wrong during an event? So I can think of a few different situations that could happen during an in-person event, uh, but I've summarized here the ones that I consider the most important. And I'm gonna start out from the most clear-cut situations. These are medical emergencies. I mean, touch wood, you might have somebody drop dead in your conference. What do you do? Apart from freaking out and going like, oh, they're not breathing anymore. So what do you do after that? They're not necessarily, those kind of situations are not necessarily um, a result of a violation of any kind, but uh, they can be very disruptive as well. And obviously, they, they cause a lot of stress to the people who are around. We could also have critical safety violations. Uh, some of those basically include uh, physical harm. Um, it could be a physical assault. It could be a sexual assault. Thank God, as far as I know, we do not tend to experience things like that in our events. But it's always good to keep those things in mind, that they might happen. The legal term for a, for a physical assault, it involves intention to make somebody feel threatened that, they, that more harm might come to them. However, we can still make people feel very, very uncomfortable even if we do not intend to do that. By simply touching them in places that are not appropriate or not expected in the context of that particular event. We could have band users showing up at an event. Now, band users, whether locally by the community or globally by the community or the Wikimedia Foundation, um, they are de facto restricted from attending events. They are not allowed to contribute to the projects, so by default they should all also no longer be showing up at events. However, you know, sometimes somebody might attempt to show up, or they might indeed show up, and that's a de facto uh, violation of the terms of the ban. And that could also make people feel uncomfortable. We could have major safety violations. We almost had the same thing in Iran just because we know we had a band user and we had a meeting. He came, we didn't know him, he took a picture of all members. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so these things happen.
just have to be a global one, it can be a local <coughs> one, like a one that the local community has closed. Um, still, you know, his him being at the conference and just logging in, probably just to check his watch list, caused everyone who didn't have the, uh, the reviewer user rights to be blocked from editing the project. So yes, the, the, the impact is real. I'd be blocking for everyone. So this is what we have to do. The impact is definitely real. And as I go through the list, I think uh, many of you might uh, be able to think of at least one or two situations where something like that has happened uh, in an in-person event in your local community. So we could have uh, major safety violations. Um, those are basically situations that uh, result in the affected individual experiencing a great deal of stress of, or they are feeling threatened. This could include targeted harassment, it could include explicit verbal personal attacks, implicit, whoop, there we go, back, yes. yes, and we're back. They could include sexual threats or repeated unwanted actions after an explicit request to stop. Basically, somebody's doing something inappropriate, the other person tells them, this is making me feel uncomfortable, or just please stop, and they continue to do that. They could also include moderate to minor safety violations. And this, in my opinion, is where it really starts to get interesting. These types of violations may or may not always be intentionally designed to upset other people. They may include inappropriate comments, on wiki arguments that are becoming hostile or heating in-person debate. So when you're transferring a discussion from the online uh, interactions over to the offline interactions. It could be also inappropriate content that might be maybe accidentally presented during an event, like in a presentation. Um, I am personally aware of at least one situation where that, that has actually happened. It could also be, and that's even more interesting in my opinion, unclear safety violations. These consist of commentary or actions that are not inappropriate or abusive per se, um, unless you consider them within a very specific context. So you might have two people interacting in an offline situation and as a person witnessing the interaction, you're thinking, Everything is fine, no bad words exchanged, no threats, no nothing. However, those two people might have a bit of a background of not getting along, or one has caused a bit of uh, uh, the, the other person to feel a bit uncomfortable in their online interaction. So unless you have this kind of contextual information to the interaction, these kind of uh, violations, they're not always clear. So they can go very easily unnoticed uh, by most people attending, but they could very easily make the person feel very uncomfortable. And they can definitely be very alienating for some people. So what do we do about it? And quite importantly, who's responsible? Uh, who should make sure that these things that don't happen? Or if they do happen, they are appropriately dealt with. It can be the event organizing team. That's the, the team of people who are organizing the events. They are making sure that all preparations are made in advance. Uh, they're in charge of the logistics. They make sure that everybody's fed, they've got somewhere to sleep, the whole lot. It can also be the hosting organizing team. This is, to put it simply, the organization that is funding the event. Where do you get your money to host your event? Is it your own money that you fundraise? Or is it money that you have gotten through a grant from the Wikimedia Foundation or so? It can be the venue staff and security. In some situations, uh, like here for example, you may be organizing events that are big enough to require a larger, a larger place, uh, like a hotel, like a conference center. In those cases, those guys will usually have their own security. 
and for sure those uh, share a little bit of the responsibility in maintaining a safe space for everybody. But it can also be the participants. We can also, as attendees, share in the responsibility of keeping the event safe. So nobody's really excluded from this. We are all part of this and we all share in the responsibility. So how can we increase um, the safety during the events? Well, before, during and after. What can we do? There are several things that can be done from all sides in preparation of during and after the event. I'm going to start off with the things that the event organizing team can do. They can be checking the registrations before the event uh, commences, like in the early stages of the preparation. They can simply check the, the names on their list and see if there is any name that pops up that they are aware that should not be in that event because, because they're banned. You could liaise with the venue. Uh, as an event organizer, you can make sure that they have uh, sufficient, sufficient uh, either uh, staff or um, processes and protocols in place that would help, would help you handle an incident should that occur during your event. Assessing the needs. If the venue doesn't have security, you need to make sure that as an event organizer, you perform a risk assessment and identify any potential risks and work on a way to mitigate them. Plan your layout. Consider the space that you have available for your event and think about logistical hiccups. Is there a reasonably quiet space for people to retrieve to? Um, as I don't know if any of you were in Asaf's presentation yesterday, the workshop about uh, group conversation, he was saying that you know there are introverts and extroverts, and sometimes people who are introverts, after an intense interaction with others, they really do feel the need to go to a safe and quiet place where they can recharge before they go back out there, out there and interact with people again. Designate an emergency response team. Decide who will handle um, a report of an incident should that happen. What are they going to do? Decide on escalation policies. So once they get the report, who to speak to next, how to handle the event. Um, being prepared and thinking about the possible ways that you can handle a potential event, um, incident can be extremely helpful once you're on the ground and in a situation where you actually have to do it. Uh, very often, you don't have much time to think when this is happening. So being prepared and having thought about it in advance can definitely help you deal with it better once it happens. Request participants to explicitly agree to any behavioral standards that are in place the family space policies, code of conduct, whatever else that you might have in place locally. Get people to specifically agree that they're going to abide by those behavioral standards. Prepare information. So getting people to agree when they register is definitely one step towards that direction. But people forget. It could be one or two months from the time you agreed to those, uh, to those behavioral uh, policies and until you actually are at the event. So it's very easy to forget about these things. It always helps to have perhaps an, uh, an A4 poster that highlights the, in bullet points and in easy to understand language what people are expected to do, the way they are expected to behave and the kind of behavior that is not tolerated. You can post it throughout the conference space and it can serve as a good reminder to people. 
Ensure that uh, your emergency team is visible. So this is in a way more of a logistical consideration. Think about how your participants are going to be able to identify who to go to if something happens to them during the event. Are they going to be wearing a different color t-shirts, fancy hats, a different badge? Um, any ways to visually easily identify the person that you can speak to is very helpful for the person who is either reporting uh, an incident because they witnessed it or because they personally experienced it. And advertise the response team. Having the team is probably only halfway until you actually tell people that this team exists. So very often uh, in the opening day, in the opening introductions, make sure that you inform the crowd that, hey, by the way, should you have any issues, should you want to report any violations, these are the people to report them to. Putting a face to the name is also very helpful for the, for the person that might be reporting an incident. Be ready to act. Members of the emergency team and the organizing team are also participants and they're also entitled to enjoy the conference. But don't forget to stay vigilant and to keep an eye on things. Once the event is completed, it's good practice to make a record of whatever incidents were reported throughout the, the uh, conference. Uh, it allows you to review with a clearer head what happened. It allows you to think about ways that things didn't go as well as they could have gone. Allows you to identify areas of improvement. <coughs> Follow up. In some situations, that, uh, especially when it comes to the major or moderate safety violations, it's a good idea to follow up with the person who was immediately affected. It shows you you do care that this extends further than just that specific space and specific time. You want to make sure that they felt supported. You want to make sure that if there was any follow-up issues with the person they had reported, you know about it. And get self-care. I mean, I think that most people who might be part of an emergency team, they, this is not their day job. This is not what they do. They're not always um, comfortable handling incidents uh, and violations uh, of any kind. So doing this can actually create a lot of stress for them. So if you're an event organizer who is in the safety team, do take care of yourself after this happens. Talk to somebody, vent, you know. Just make sure that it doesn't stay with you and don't carry it. So what the hosting organization team can do is support the local organizers in multiple ways. They can set up appropriate policies that can be an example to be copied and pasted in, in, uh, intact, or they can, uh, the local organizers or the local communities um, can adopt to the local norms. Provide material. I think everybody has to appreciate that uh, when the local organizing team is preparing for an event, they've got like a million and one things to do. Making that process easier for them could be as simple as creating that little slide of like A4 size uh, um, poster that can go on the wall, sending it out to them so that they don't have to create it. It can be little simple things like that that can remove some of the uh, burden as they prepare for the event. If you have your own staff as a hosting organizing team uh, on the ground attending the event, see if you can make those guys available to help the local organizers. Um, 
I happened to be one of those people on the ground supporting local orga organizers with handling events as it kind of ties in with what I do for living. So this is one way to help the locals deal with whatever might come up during um, an event. So, and this is very important as well in my opinion, if not the most important, what can event participants do to contribute towards creating a safe environment and maintaining it? Familiarize yourself with behavioral guidelines. Yes, you've read them. You read them when they were being created, you read them through the consultation periods, but it's easy to forget. So it never hurts to spend some time, five minutes, and kind of reread those guidelines. It's, you, you, can, you cannot imagine how important that can be. Also, familiarize yourself with the response team. If you witness something or you experience something, knowing who to go to is important. Because especially if you experience something bad, it is not your first thing that comes to mind to look for the person. But if you already know that they're wearing this color t-shirt, or it's that bearded face with the glasses that I should try and find if something happens, having that knowledge already really does help you when, you have, when you're in a situation where you want to report something. Be an ally. Be willing to stand up and speak on behalf of those who might be affected by a safety violation. Be willing to speak up when somebody's doing something that is testing the boundaries of inappropriate. Be ready to report an issue. Watching something happen is one thing. But if you actually take the extra step to report it, that means that you're actively doing something so that this doesn't happen again. <coughs> and keep an open mind. I think this is a very important thing. When different people from different cultures come together, the way we are used to treat others also translates into our offline behavior. This may or may not be acceptable. What something is acceptable in our culture may not be acceptable in another culture. So think before you act. Think about how what you do might affect the other people around you. When Wikimedians meet in person, they move from the online environment over to the offline environment. When you move from online interactions to offline interactions, the main vessel of your communication changes. You rely on spoken communication more than on written communication. And that can make a big difference in the way people assess the content that you're trying to communicate. In simpler words, Something that you might say in writing can be perceived in a very different way when you say it orally. Because people have different information to fully assess what you're saying. And when that happens, the possibility of miscommunication and misunderstanding increases. While both oral and written communication aim at the, same uh, at the same target purpose, to relay a message, they vary differently, they vary drastically in the, in the delivery methods. Oral communication does not require literacy. You do not need to be able to, to read and write in order, in order to understand what the person is saying to you, provided it, it's in a language that you understand. In oral communication, the speed of transmission is very different. It happens instantly. The moment you say the words, 
their elder. The person had heard it at the same time. In written communication, you might write something today and the other person reads it a week later. So it happens at a much, much slower pace. For uh, those who, who are uh, familiar with Latin, <laughs> I'm looking at you, Asa. Verb of one landscript amanent. Uh, spoken words fly, written words remain. Unless oral communication is recorded, there is basically no proof it ever existed apart from in people's memories. You rely on your recollection on, of what was said during the, the, the interaction. On the other side of the spectrum, in written communication, um, things stay forever. Well, kind of. I mean, you can change them in Wikipedia. So basically, in, in written language, we cannot really correct <coughs> themselves unless we are editing in Wikipedia in, uh, on any of the projects. Uh, whereas in spoken language, we can make corrections instantly. You get uh, information about how the other person perceived what you said, and you're like, oh, no, 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 I actually meant this and that and the other. And that's the instant feedback. So you can change things. In written communication, that can also happen, but again, at a much lower pace. I was talking about the speed of transmission earlier. The margin to review one's words before they submit them in writing is quite big. Whereas when you're interacting in person with somebody, this margin is almost non-existent. You're thinking on your feet. You're saying the words and the thoughts that come to your mind at that time. And another major difference between oral and written communication is that in the former, you have non-verbal cues you rely on more than the content in order to assess what the other person is saying to you. In spoken language, your understanding and perception of the content can be very different. You consider the other person's body language, the, uh, the tone of their voice, their expressions, before you make up your mind about what you think that other person just told you. This is important to consider as those differences can contribute to potential issues ranging from unclear to major safety violations. In fact, I wanted to touch a little bit more to those differences and how they affect our interactions. Uh, according to a research that was done back in the 70s, uh, I think by an Iranian uh, researcher, Albert Mer Merhabian, our assessment of the content in written communication is based 100% on the content. Our assessment of the content in oral communication can be based to as little as 7% on the content. And the 93% that remains is based on all the visual cues, the tone, the facial expressions, the body language, the, the gestures that people make. Are they speaking closer to you or further from you? Are they grimacing? Are they shouting? Are they speaking in a very agitated tone? So when that happens, as I mentioned earlier, the probability of miscommunication and misunderstanding increases. And obviously also the probability of a potential safety violation increases. I'm cautious of uh, the time restrictions, so I wanted to just do that little introduction for everybody. If you would like to find out more about how to, to create safe events and how to maintain safe events, there is a lot more information on a, a set of training modules that were recently created by the foundation. 
Um, you can find them. There is one module on keeping events safe, which is basically a much more expanded version of my talk to you today. And there is a separate training module on dealing with online harassment. I have to warn you, that's quite a big training module. It has many different smaller modules. Uh, I would strongly encourage people to take those modules as I think that they can be very, very beneficial, even as just information to keep at the back of your head. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Sorry? These training modules are hosted on the outreach dashboards and um, I have to admit that I was not involved in the, in the technical element of transferring the, the contents onto the platform. So I'm not fully aware personally about the limitations or the capabilities of the, of the platform itself. But I can definitely make sure to pass on that feedback. Is it going to be expanded in the future? Are there some content? We would definitely like to create <coughs> more training modules. In fact, I was watching the presentation of uh, the lovely gentleman who was from the Netherlands yesterday. And he mentioned that they were in the process of creating um, a training module on uh, conflict resolution which I think would tie in with this kind of work seamlessly. And I would, we would want the community to basically use those as a kind of a starting point and think about what other things related to safety, whether online or offline, they would like to see and whether they might be interested to start working on them. That's the idea. I mean, resource-wise, I think that uh, we are quite restricted at the foundation uh, as to producing more of those. Uh, they did take the better part of, uh, of two quarters for us, so it's probably not something that we can support definitely, but we certainly want the community to kind of carry those out and produce more as they see the need for them. Any other questions or thoughts? Everything is clear. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess if you don't have any other questions, uh, we're uh, we're finished about what twenty minutes earlier, so you can go back to having a break. Thank you very much. <laughs>